Hey everybody, good day and welcome to another exciting episode of the OIG Roundtable. We got the full group today. Jason got a reprieve from the warden. He's back for a, it's almost like he's a special guest because it's been so long. He said it felt like it was six months since he hadn't been on one. It was really only about two weeks, Jason. But that means absence makes the heart grow fonder versus out of sight, out of mind. We appreciate that. Back again with uh, the normal crew, though. We got Wade McFall, assistant special agent charge, now part of our SIU investigative team. Apparently, he did not get the memo that we weren't wearing collared shirts, but that's okay. <laughs> Matt's back, as always. Matt Kachansky, retired senior executive from HHS OIG, retired UPIC Northeast director, and now one of the managers on our SIU investigative team. And, of course, we welcome Jason back. Matt's counterpart from HHS OIG and the Western UPIC director, uh, now running some special projects on our operational side. It's funny when I talk about Jason and Matt having all of these different jobs. It's, it's amazing for two guys that are 40 years old. You've, you've done a lot, but clearly working in the government has aged you substantially, whereas Wade and I, <laughs> young bucks that we are. So today we're going to talk. We've got a, this is kind of an interesting one. We're going to divert a little bit from our uh, from what we've been talking about over the past few weeks, which is really on this SIU improvement and, and kind of SIU development. And uh, we want to rope some external things in and how that kind of interfaces with SIUs. I put up a post uh, last week on LinkedIn. Uh, I blogged about something uh, that's currently going on. I believe it's in 10 states. Uh, there has been approval for pharmacists to start to have a limited independent prescribing and therefore dispensing authority. And the three, the three areas are for COVID, flu, and strep, strep throat. And what was interesting to me was that these three tests, uh, so you've got uh, strep is an antibiotic treated condition. Uh, flu has an antiviral and COVID obviously has an antiviral. And, you know, those three tests are yes or no tests, right? COVID, yes or no, flu, yes or no, strep, yes or no. So there really isn't any diagnostic thing that goes on. Um, but it is interesting because what they're doing is they're they're kind of creating this even lower level, right? So, you know, traditionally you would get sick and if you didn't want to go to your doctor, you would go to the urgent care center. And then a bunch of these things, which I'll kind of call a minute clinics, but, you know, that's actually a term for, for a particular business. You know, these nurse practitioners or PAs that are running them in collaboration with a doctor, those have typically been housed in a pharmacy as a separate kind of business entity, as a medical line of business. And now we're getting to kind of this even lower level, which is uh, the premise of you feel like you've got something going on. And you go to the pharmacy and the pharmacist or a technician typically will actually do the swab, come up with the test result, and then the pharmacist can prescribe that medication. And, and, as, and as we all know that with COVID, uh, you were able to get the antiviral from the pharmacist directly, right, which saved a little bit of time and effort because prior to pharmacists being able to do that, you'd maybe go to a pharmacy, you'd get your positive test, and then you'd have to go to an urgent care center, get the prescription, then go back to the pharmacy. So you've saved a little bit of that. But this is really, you know, one of those areas where it's you're getting to this even lower level. Um, uh, and and I, I don't want to be disrespectful to pharmacists, but it's this kind of lower level or different level of healthcare practitioner where they're not really making an independent diagnosis. Right. They're not they're not doing uh, ear infections and sinus infections, although who knows what will happen based upon this. And so, wait, I want to start with you, because one of the things that we talked about when we started to talk about this, there's two things. One is this whole uh, premise of licensure creep and our pharmacists now being given some additional authorities that creates that licensure creep. But then secondarily is your own insurance, um, your preferred pharmacy PBM is now sending you text messages about getting, you know, going to your local um, chain pharmacy to get this uh, to get this done at a cash rate, right? So, number one, let's talk about this whole premise of the the scope creep and the licensure and how that makes your head spin as an SIU investigator now have to think about um, now is this provider doing what they're entitled to do in the state? Yeah, and and there's been a couple different in that article and the kind of the attached article from, I forget which news outlet it was, but they were talking to the state pharmacy. I don't know if it was the state pharmacy boards involved. Um, I think it was the boards 
but they were saying that the uh, pharmacists have been trained to do these types of things for years now and assumingly that means going back to covid when they kind of took on some extra duties as far as testing and and even um, vaccination administration things of that nature but the, the house bill that we're talking about here the equitable community access to pharmacy services act i think it's called um the american medical association is saying they don't have the training and education to do this they're not trained to do it so you have you know two different opinions there which would have to be you know ironed out first of all are they are they able to do this this stuff or not and and, and granted some of going back to the, the COVID days you know a swab isn't very technical as far as swabbing someone's cheek and sticking it in a, a test tube so there's not a whole lot of uh training and education that would probably need to happen there but i think part of the issue like you say going and do the siu head spin is now we're going to have situations where pharmacists are allowed to do these tests and maybe vaccinations and things of that nature but now we're going to get into a situation where it's like an incident to used to call it um, where someone else is providing a service incident to the supervision of a pharmacist or in most the cases we used to deal with incident to a doctor supervision but i think the the problem here is you're going to you're going to end up with um you know there's debate as to whether the pharmacists are are really trained to do this but then you're going to have pharmacy techs probably who are really going to be doing the work that are going to be doing the swabs and maybe injections of vaccinations things of that nature so we have this situation where even less trained or qualified people are going to probably be doing the actual work and then it gets into as as we had talked about before this call a whole situation of how do you how do you track that how do you show that the the tests were actually done uh, it, there's just a there, there's a lot of um room for new fraud situations to take place with this whole uh, new idea now, you know, the thing that's interesting is that it's all starting off where um, and, and there's it's CVS, Walgreens and Walmart pharmacies are the three big chains that are rolling this out. And what they're clear about is that these are going to be cash payments only. So no insurance is going to be implemented. So the question really is, if there's a fraud, waste, abuse issue, it's on an individual like directly as cash. The question um, that I that I've been really trying to get an answer to is is the amount of what it's going to cost to get one of these tests administered similar to what your copay would have been and so is it a wash and, and obviously the next iteration becomes <clears throat> if you're taking cash today you're going to seek to get insurance um you know get into an insurance plan to get this covered tomorrow and so will will flu tests and will strep tests be treated as a medical claim um crossover claim the way that they were doing it with with COVID, you know, if you remember in the beginning, one of the biggest issues was when, when they passed uh, all of the COVID legislation, that one of the big things was that you were going to be able to get free COVID tests. And the question became, if you were a commercial payer in the pharmacy, how do you do that, right? Because a COVID test is the equivalent of like a DME product or something like that. It's not a pharmaceutical. So how do you do that? And then remember initially Medicare and Medicaid was excluded and then they were included. And then, you know, it ultimately got rectified through a crossover claim on the NDCs that, that went over similar to where they were doing things like diabetic testing, strips, you know, and the like. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's the next iteration. Then the question becomes, and you, you, this is a great point you made, Wade, is this whole premise of incident two, that if this does get treated ultimately as a medical claim, and then there's potentially an expansion of things that a pharmacist will be able to do within what they're calling that scope of practice, the question becomes, how do you get that collaboration? And pharmacy systems don't do medical systems, right? They don't have an EMR template. They don't have the ability that pharmacists do not know how to document a medical claim and an EMR, you know, who's going to be doing the patient's uh, medical history, even if it's a low level, what, maybe if it's even built out as a 99211 or a 99212. Um, and, and then that's another question is, if the patient is an existing patient of the pharmacy, does it become a 99212, uh, 99211, 99212? Or is it a new, is it a 99202 because it's a new patient? I mean, that's a great, you know, thing that, that 
I think will have to be vetted out. Are these considered new patients or existing patients? Who's doing the blood pressure, the vital signs, the medical history and all that? Pharmacy technicians are not medical assistants. Does that mean that they have to now be cross-trained and, and the like? So I think there's there's probably a lot that will come out of that. So Jason, I want to go to you because a couple of things from resource management, resource allocation, and then that process improvement piece that you've been very intrinsically involved with as of late is, you know, the thing that comes to mind for me is when a insurance plan comes out with a medical policy for coverage, I'm not aware of instances where somebody from the medical director's office says, hey, Jason, uh, from an investigative perspective, we're thinking of coming up with this policy. What do you think? And so there's you know, like from a resource allocation perspective, your head's got to spin when you find out that there's something else that's coming up in which your opinion wasn't asked um, or any of the potential collateral consequences of that. So what are the what are some of the things that you think of immediately when you start to think about, you know, there's going to be a new policy for coverage coming on and it could be relative to this. It could be relative to some broader things. What are some of the things that come to mind as to, you know, where should medical, where should an, an, an NCD, LCD, a medical policy, what are some of those collateral things that they should be thinking of to make the SIU world's life uh, not better, but more manageable? Well, certainly access to care, speed of delivery of care are extremely important in managing a patient's condition. So it's great to be able to get tests with, uh, I guess, minimal, minimal number of uh, control points. But the reality is, is that uh, there are costs associated with the delivery of that care. And where there is a cost, that means there's an opportunity to potentially um, either abuse that or, frankly, even uh, get involved in some sort of fraudulent um, practice with it. So it's a delicate balance, but it's not unmanageable. Uh, you have to think about it from an internal control point of view. And frankly, I, I always like the expression gatekeeper. So who are the gatekeepers with the service? And, you know, in a situation where it's potentially a cash delivery and, you know, patient uh, directed, uh, you know, the, the control points are going to be minimal at best. And what exacerbates the problem is that uh, if we're talking about services such as these in the world of healthcare, they're relatively low dollar services. So if the oversight or the control body, whether it's a program integrity unit, an SIU, a benefit integrity unit, wh whatever that unit is called, uh, has resources devoted to that. When you think about what it takes to, to evaluate those services and see if there is any, any uh, abuse or fraud for that matter, it's very hard to have a return on investment without sampling and without extrapolation. So all of those things have to be taken into account by the front office people that are concerned with costs and not just uh, program delivery. Having said all that, um, I'll take this as an opportunity to say something that I've really focused a lot on in the last six months to a year as I've looked at a number of SIUs, I think that the industry could do so much more uh, by uh, developing the patient, the member, whatever the right term of art is for the, you know, for the program that's paying for the service with, you know, the hypothetical service we're talking about. It, the If that unit would think about developing patients as the gatekeepers, it would be awesome. I mean, frankly, I've I've played with the idea of some sort of um, you know when you when you have a patient who is actually responding to the explanation of benefits, 
maybe there's a point system that they can have. Uh, it can be rebates. It could be any number of things, but uh, they would be an excellent uh, gatekeeper in the types of services we're talking about here. So that's actually a great point, because one of the things that we can all agree on is that when you get your explanation of benefits, they're nearly impossible to read, even by people with trained eyes like us, right? There's there's never enough information to provide a good enough description for someone to really care to, to do that, to do that work. I think the wrinkle that we get on something like this is that these are pharmacy claims, which are point of sale items, right? So a beneficiary, a member, whoever it is, you don't really get any. What you get is on your receipt, you get that thing that says your insurance saved you, you made your copay. So yeah, so from a process perspective, I think it hits, it hits a couple of things. Like, is there really that piece of the puzzle that's out there? But the other part that you just talked about, which is actually probably the most important point um, in this is that skin in the game, right? That the, the member getting something for doing this. Now, what's interesting is there are some tools out there and we actually work with a firm that developed a, an app and that app is for the individual insurance plan where, and this is not for, this is not for an upcoding. This is really for phantom billing, meaning that the patient was never there. The, the, the patient arrives at their doctor's office, they open up their app and the app geolocates them and says, Hey, are you at Dr. Eisengrime's office located at blah, blah, blah. And you check the box. Yes. And then that information gets funneled back to the plan. And then when the claims get processed, there's a matching. And what you get is a red flag of an instance where when Dr. Eisengrind submits a claim for patient McFall, who wasn't there, well, patient McFall didn't hit that. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of a human element in there, but it's, you know, it, it's at it's it's in it's in patient Wade McFall's interest to click that because what these plans are doing with our with our partner on this is they get a point system similar to exactly what you're talking about Jay where they get a point system and those points can then be redeemed for gift cards uh you know visa gift cards or dinner gift cards or whatever it is and so there's this carrot and the stick where the plan is saying look we're trying to reduce the cost of your health care by not paying for un un uh unrendered services, right? Uh, phantom billing. And so, but it just hasn't caught on yet for, for whatever reason. We talked to a lot of our uh, payer clients about this tool and it does actually work. It does not involve the provider. It is strictly on the patient side, meaning that, you know, Dr. Eisengrind doesn't know that the patient is checking this box. And if they did, it doesn't even matter because it's not, in, there's no interface that occurs with that. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of that. And what we see generally is that on the on the payer side, the, the explanation of benefit forms are just so difficult to read. It'll say office visit and a date. There's no information about it. doesn't really tell you anything. And so yeah, getting that engagement with the patient, the member, whatever you want to call it, is, is clearly a very important piece of the puzzle. But I think that when you've got certain sectors of people where they don't, for example, if you're a dual beneficiary, right, the whole point of uh, the 20% copay in the Medicare world and then collaterally in the, uh, in the commercial world was skin in the game. If I have to pay a $50 copay, I better make sure I'm getting the things that I'm being told I'm getting. And I think the problem is that through over time, combinations of schemes, waiver of co-pays, um, secondary insurance where the patient doesn't ever actually get a bill or their bill is de minimis, that they tend to care less and less about that. And so the skin in the game doesn't exist. You know, I remember working on a, a big podiatry fraud case where the provider came in, he was giving pedicures basically, waiving co-pays, and I would talk to the to the beneficiaries who were being treated by him. And I would say, well, you know, why were you going to him if you don't have any problems? And they would say, well, it was a free service and I didn't have to tip them. So they were like, if I went to the salon and got my pedicure, I'd have to pay for it and I'd have to tip them. Why would I not do this? It's a free service. And it's like, well, it's not really free, right? And but nobody wants to hear that. Like you're paying for it through your Medicare, your monthly, you know, costs and what have you. So yeah, I think I think that's a struggle that constantly goes on in the uh, in sort of that member outreach team 
But, you know, I think SIUs are constantly prying to uh, to the people that make the determinations of what these explanation of benefits are going to look for. But it's a great point. Like engagement with the membership is really the number one gatekeeper. It's like when we're talking to our uh, billers and coders, we say to the billers and coders, you are the first line of defense in fraud prevention. Right? Because that's really what it is. So. Matt, I want to go to you for this last little piece before we run out of time. And that's like from a policy and from an administrative perspective and an investigative perspective, obviously, if insurance begins and we're talking hypothetically, but if insurance begins to cover some of these costs and it's not a cash item, it's more data, it's more to manage, it's more policy development. What do you consider to be low hanging fruit? I mean, it's a little bit like getting back to when we're talking to Jason is. SIU and medical policy don't always sit in the same room and talk. And, you know, you get it's it's almost like we would talk about it at the UPIX, the unfunded mandates and the stretching of the thin resources. I mean, how do you deal with what's going to potentially be an entire new line of business that's never been, uh, you know, the waters have not been tested? Yeah. Uh, go back a little bit. And uh, I can't agree with with Jason more about you know the access to care and all that is you know, extremely important and what we saw during you know the the recent PHE was that direct access you know they created things out of whole cloth that made care much easier telehealth exploded the home covid test kits all of that all of that very important to the to the care of the nation but what came with that were waivers of the guardrails that were protecting the program integrity of the of the benefits themselves. So I, I believe the same thing happens, you know, in something as simple as a new DME device is developed. The policy hasn't been developed yet, but they're selling it. And and there's vulnerabilities there. And the job of an SIU like with the UPIX, was to identify what those vulnerabilities were. And what we did as a UPIC for the PHE is we looked at every one of the waivers that came out from CMS. And then how was that going to be impacted in the billing? Where, where could we look for those vulnerabilities in what was being billed by the laboratories for the COVID tests for, you know, the 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 extra E and M's plus the you know the the test whatever we we sat down for weeks coming up with what models could we put into the data to see you know where the vulnerabilities are where are the spikes where are those things that we should anticipate where the fraud was going to be based on where the waivers were where the vulnerabilities were and it, you know even though we were coming in after the fact a little bit we were able to identify fairly quickly where those vulnerabilities were and we built dozens and dozens of models that we put into the data that we were processing on a daily basis and we were able then to hone our resources to those areas where the vulnerabilities were you know were were coming to fruition where we found you know the billing for every type of, of lung test when they were just doing a COVID test, adding on the E&M to the, to the test. All of those things we were finding because we were able to anticipate these were the areas where they were going to happen. And I think any SAU has to do the same thing with this. It's going to be, you know, are they going to be billing for E&Ms along with those, you know, with the testing for COVID or the flu or, or strep? Are they are they billing for just the brand names of the pharmaceuticals instead of the generics? And are they, you know, is big pharma getting involved with this? Do you see that there are training seminars being put on by big pharma to these pharmacists on how to implement this program? Oh, and by the way, you know, look at the spike in the sales of these particular brands of of antivirals or or antibiotics because of the influence of big pharma. So those are the things you have to start anticipating as an SIU so that you can then look to those areas to then, then investigate. 
Yeah, no, those are those are great points because then you start to talk about things like in the commercial space, how are coupons and copay assistance programs going to be implicated? Now, these are I think these are fairly inexpensive drugs. I think at least the, at least on the COVID antiviral, because that was a heavily subsidized drug. We'll see. We'll see what's going to happen there. But yeah, there's always you know I know at least the the flu drug has a generic, and so the question becomes. Is the pharma industry now going to get in there with some um, with some work to induce for the name brand prescribing, you know, of this? Because now you've got, in typical fashion, um, most PBMs will only pay for a generic, um, even when a generic is available, unless there is a dispensed as written or patient request, right? So I've worked on a number of pharmacy cases, and all of us have, where the, the doctor checks DAW dispensed as written, or there's an override where if there's a generic available that would be the one that would be paid for, the name brand would typically not, but there's an override where the pharmacist can put a code in when they submit their claims to the PBMs where they're saying, okay, while this is a generic prescription, the patient is required requesting the name brand. We saw that, uh, I saw that a bunch of times um, with early with, with the with the 5% lidocaine, where it wasn't a dispense that's written. They wanted not the generic, they wanted a name brand version, which was substantially more expensive. So yeah, there are a whole bunch of collateral things. Our sales reps going to now be courting phys, um, pharmacists the way that they court physicians. Um, to get them to, you know, even on the generics to, to do that. I, I think that that's going to be another area that, you know, is going to be a challenge. Are pharmacists going to be induced in some way without anybody knowing, similar to the way, you know, are there going to be lunchrooms um, with the standard six foot hero sandwich um, or, you know, the, the, the pasta and, you know, stopping off at the local Salamiria. For those of you that aren't from the New York, New Jersey area, that's the Italian market where, you know, where you're getting your tray of eggplant and pasta and, you know, your fresh, your fresh uh, rolls. Is that something that can possibly happen? I mean, I, I think these are all things that uh, SIUs, I think, oftentimes spend a little bit of their day uh, trying to be reactive versus proactive, right? Because it's, it's always about putting out a fire that you're finding. But, you know, one of the ways that SIUs can work to kind of think about this is in, in proper intelligence, right? I mean, having people who aren't just there vetting complaints, but working as intelligence analysts, looking at press releases, looking at FDA, going up onto the FDA website, looking at what the newest approved devices are and seeing what those scams are going to be. And then looking at things like this which someone can get in front of and say, okay, let's start to spitball and think about if there was going to be a fraud scheme, if this were to hit insurance, how is that going to play into, into the mix? So, you know, this is, this is a very, very specific example of something that really is much more of a broader discussion when it comes to SIU operations is how do you get in front of things in anticipation of them happening or get to them before they really become, you know, problematic. I think, you know, your, the telemedicine example is, is a great one. I think that everybody was kind of thinking in terms of, oh, this is a great way to give that access to people for care. But I think there was a lack of thought process about what all the collateral frauds are going to be. So uh, advice to the SIU community that's listening. Think about this because insurance is going, this is going to be something I can, uh, my prediction is that at some point insurance will cover some of these things uh, there will be a lobby effort to do it from the pharma industry to make this a covered service. Um, so lots to keep track of this. I'm going to keep up on uh, on this and and blog about it more and see see where we go. So it'll it'll be great to see how this all plays out in the in the coming year or so once this all settles. So we're out of time as always. It goes quick. Thanks, guys. As always, Jason. I expect to see you in the uh, conference room next week. Uh, maybe next week we'll have collar shirts. Maybe we'll have T-shirts. We'll see. Will we As have always, a six foot hero? What's that? Are we going to have a six foot hero in the conference room? We might. We might have a six foot, a six foot Italian, gluten free roll. For those of for those that aren't from New York, the hero is a sub, a hoagie, a grinder. Whatever your regional, whatever your regional selection is, it's like soda and pop. It's good to see you guys as always.
Yep. Again, okay. if you're not getting our newsletter, hello at advise, A-D-V-I-Z-E, health.com. Every week it comes out. You can get our podcasts linked over to that. Uh, if you are interested in seeing some of our old podcasts, you can go up onto our YouTube channel. You can also get us on Spotify. You can get us through our webpage. LinkedIn Live this past uh, Wednesday, we had David Blank. It was spectacular. Uh, we'll be doing another podcast, another LinkedIn Live in October. We'll be announcing who that guest will be coming up. So stay with us on LinkedIn. Stay with us on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram. We're on all of them. Come find us, chat with us. We'd love to hear from you. We'll see you all in the next one. Thank you. Thank you all.